you helped Saint Francis to reflect the image of Christ through a life of poverty and humility. May we follow your son by walking in the footsteps of Francis of Assisi and by imitating his joyful love. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. The preparation part of the Mass having been concluded, we hear now the celebration of the Word of God. The first reading today will be from Galatians, St. Paul's letter to the Galatians 6, 14 to 18. It will be read by Maria Roseman, whose husband Ron is a farmer in Shelby County. They belong to St. Boniface Parish, Westphalia. From the letter of Paul to the Galatians. May I never boast of anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through it, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It means nothing whether one is circumcised or not. All that matters is that one is created anew. Peace and mercy on all who followed this rule of life and on the Israel of God. Henceforth, let no one trouble me, for I bear the brand marks of Jesus in my body. Brothers and sisters, may the favor of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. The responsory is by Father John Foley, based on Psalm 34, the cry of the poor. The assembly will join in the refrain the Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the Lord.
second reading from the Gospel itself will be preceded by an acclamation, Alleluia, praise to God. The deacon will present himself to the Pope and ask for his blessing. It's Marvin Leo Klein, a permanent deacon, farmer from Dunlap. He and his wife, Dolores, are the parents of five children. According to Matthew. On one occasion, Jesus said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, to you I offer praise for what you have hidden from the learned and the clever, you have revealed to the merest children. Father, it is true. You have graciously willed it so. Everything has been given over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son but the Father, and no one knows the Father but the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are weary, and find life burdensome, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon your shoulders and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart. Your soul will find rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. The homily or scriptural reflection on the Gospel and the reading will now be given by His Holiness after He Himself has kissed the Gospel text in respect for the Word of God.
What is the significance of the replacing of the mitre? When the uh, bishop or the pope speaks, they put their hand on <laughs> Sign of his office's teacher. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, here in the heartland of America, in the middle of the bound field fields, at harvest time, I come to celebrate the Eucharist. As I stand in your presence in this period of autumn harvest, those words which I repeated whenever people gather for the Eucharist seem to be so appropriate. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. As one who has always been close to nature. Let me speak to you today about the land, the earth, and that which earth has given and human hands have made. The land is God's gift entrusted to people from the very beginning. It is God's gift given by a loving Creator as a means of sustaining the life which He had created. But the land is not only God's gift, it is also man's responsibility. Man himself created from the dust of the earth was made its master in order to bring forth fruit, the land would depend upon the genius and skillfulness, the sweat and the toil of the people to whom God would entrust it. Thus the full which would sustain life on earth is willed by God to be both that which earth has given and human hands have made. To all of you, who are farmers and all who are associated with agricultural production, I want to say this. The Church highly esteems your work. Christ himself showed 
his esteem for agricultural life when he described God, his father, as the vine dresser. You cooperate with the Creator, the vine dresser, in sustaining and nurturing life. You fulfill the command of God given at the very beginning. Fill the earth and subdue it. Here, in the heart heartland of America, the valleys and hills have been blanketed with grain. The herds and the flocks have multiplied many times over. By hard work, you have become masters of the earth and you have subdued it. By reason of the abundant fruitfulness which modern agricultural advances have made possible, you support the lives of millions who themselves do not work on the land but who live because of what you produce. Mindful of this, I make my own the words of my beloved predecessor. Paul the Sixth. It is the dignity of those who work on the land and of all those engaged in different levels of research and action in the field of agricultural development, which must be unceasingly proclaimed and promoted. What then are the attitudes that should pervade man's relationship to the land? As always, we must look for the answer beginning with Jesus. For as St. Paul says, in your minds you must be the same as Christ Jesus. In the life of Jesus we see a real closeness to the land. In his teaching he referred to the birds of the air the lilies of the field. He talked about the farmer who went out to sow the seed and he referred to his heavenly father as the wine dresser and to himself as the good shepherd this closeness to the nature, this spontaneous awareness of creation as a gift from God, as well as the blessing of a close-knit family, characteristics of farm life in every age, including our own. These were part of the life of Jesus. Therefore, I invite you to let your attitude always be the same 
as those of Christ Jesus. Three attitudes in particular are appropriate for rural life. In the first place, gratitude. Recall the first words of Jesus in the Gospel we have just heard. Words of gratitude to his heavenly Father. Father, Lord of heaven and earth, to you I offer praise. Let this be your attitude as well. Every day the farmer is reminded of how much he depends upon God. From the heavens come the rain, the wind and the sunshine. They occur without the farmer's command or control. The farmer prepares the soil, plants the seed, and cultivates the, the crop. But God makes it grow. He alone is the source of life. Even the natural disasters, such as hailstorms and drought, tornadoes or floods, remind the farmer of his dependence upon God. Surely, it was this awareness that prompted the early pilgrims to America to establish the feast which you call Thanksgiving. After every harvest, whatever it may have been that year, with humility and thankfulness, the farmer makes his own the prayer of Jesus Father, Lord of heaven and earth, to you I offer praise. <laughs> Secondly, the land must be conserved with care, since it is intended to be fruitful for generation upon generation. You who live in the heartland of America have been entrusted with some of the earth's best land. A soil so rich in minerals, the climate so favorable for producing bountiful crops with fresh water and unpolluted air available all around you. You are stewards of some of the most important resources God has given to the world. Therefore, conserve the land well so that your children's children and generations after them will inherit an even richer land than was entrusted to you. But also remember what the heart of your vocation is. While it is true that Farming today provides an economic livelihood for the farmer. Still, it will always be more than an enterprise of profit-making. 
in farming, you cooperate with the Creator in the very sustenance of life on earth. In the third place, I want to speak about generosity, a generosity which arises from the fact that God destined the earth and, and all it contains for all men and all peoples so that all created things would be shared fairly by all mankind under the guidance of justice tempered by charity. You who are farmers today are st stewards of a gift from God which was intended for the good of all humanity. You have the potential to provide food for, for the millions who have nothing to eat and thus help to rid the world of famine. To you I direct the same question asked by Paul VI five years ago. If the potential of nature is immense, if that of the master of the human genius over the universe seems almost unlimited, what is it that is too often missing except that generosity, that anxiety which is stimulated by the sight of the sufferings and the miseries of the poor, that deep conviction that the whole family suffers when one of its members is in distress. Recall the time when Jesus saw the hungry crowd gathered on the hillside. What was his response? He did not content himself with expressing his compassion. He gave his disciples the command, give them something to eat yourselves. Did he not intend those same words for us today, for us who live at the closing of the 20th century, for us who have the means available to feed the hungry of the world? Let us respond generously to his command by sharing the fruit of our labor by contributing to others the knowledge we have gained by being the promoters of rural development everywhere and by defending the right to work of the rural population since every person has a right to useful employment. Farmers everywhere provide bread for all humanity, but it is Christ alone who is the bread of life. He alone satisfies the deepest hunger of humanity. As Saint Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. While we are mindful 
of the physical hunger of millions of our brothers and sisters on all continents, at this Eucharist we are reminded that the deepest hunger lies in the human soul. To all who acknowledge this hunger within them, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary, and find life burdensome, and I will refresh you. My brothers and sisters in Christ, let us listen to these words with all our heart. They are directed to every one of us, to all who till the soil, to all who benefit from the fruit of their labors, to every man and woman on earth, Jesus says, come to me and I will refresh you. Even if all the physical hunger of the world were satisfied, even if everyone who is hungry were fed by his or her own labor or by the generosity of others, the deepest hunger of man would still exist. We are reminded in the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians, all that matters is that one is created anew. Only Christ can create one anew. And this new creation finds its beginning only in his cross and resurrection. In Christ alone, all creation is restored to its proper order. Therefore, I say, come, all of you, to Christ. He is the bread of life. Come to Christ, and you will never be hungry again. Bring with you to Christ the products of your hands, the fruit of the land, that which earth has given and human hands have met. At this altar, these gifts will be transformed into the Eucharist of the Lord. Bring with you your efforts to make fruitful the land, your labor and your weariness, at this altar, because of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, all human activity is sanctified, lifted up, and fulfilled. Bring with you the poor, the sick, the exiled, and the hungry. Bring all who are weary, and find life burdensome. At this altar they will be refreshed, for his yoke is easy and his burden light. Above all, bring your families and dedicate them anew to Christ, so that they may continue to be the working, living, and loving community where nature is revered 
where burdens are shared and where the Lord is praised in gratitude. Amen. what His Holiness has said and what its implications are, but was there anything that particularly struck you about it? Well, it's a classic homily, very simple, building from the text of the scriptures, but including other texts of the prayers of the Mass, and leading to um, the calls to action, and uh, now moving into worship. We'll do that now with the general intercessions, which will be offered by various people of the community. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light. True God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to, to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We come humbly before our God, his at his wonders, and confident in his grace to bless and to give meaning to the mysteries of our lives. With this confidence in our hearts, we bring our prayer to him. Aft. Father John Paul, and for all Christian leaders throughout the world, that they will shoulder the yoke of Christ with courage, bringing his gentleness and humbleness of heart into the lives of all they serve, let us pray to the Lord. Second by Julie Gable. Uh, for the people who live on and in the land, for the American Indians, the farm workers, the coal miners, the timber workers, sharecroppers, family farmers, and ranchers, that the dignity of their call to steward the land will be recognized and that they will be justly rewarded for their labor 
and for what they produce. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Kelly Broderick of Waukee, Iowa. The crosses of this world weigh heavily, especially the boat people, those deprived of religious freedom, the destitute, and those of war-torn lands. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our Margaret Russell of Avoca. That we of the United States will respect and recognize our responsibilities to share the gifts of our resources, our harvests, and our knowledge with the peoples of the world, and that we will be open to the values and gifts of other cultures and ways of life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Sister Eileen Bertel of Des Moines. For each one here, that we will live in the spirit of St. Francis, setting our hearts on the kingdom of God, comforting the afflicted and suffering, living in harmony with the earth, in the continuing renewal of God's creation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And loving Father, as Saint Francis trusted in your wonderful kindness, so do we lift our hearts in joyful hope and confidence. Hear our prayer as we celebrate in gratitude for the gifts of this beloved land and its people. We ask this through your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The deacon assisting the Holy Father is Robert Howell, a permanent deacon of Holy Trinity Parish, Des Moines, and insurance salesman, the father of twin daughters. We move now to the second major part of the Eucharist, the Eucharist proper, the thanksgiving in response to the Word of God. This is modeled on the Seder Supper, the Passover meal, the offering of the gifts of bread and wine today, the gifts of the harvest and the bounty of nature, these gifts symbolic and those to be used in the distribution of the bread and wine will be offered by various members of the Des Moines community. from the musical Godspell, All Good Gifts, by Stephen Schwartz during this time of the offering and preparation of the gifts for the celebration. <coughs> the procession of the gifts is led by two standards of the colors of sea, time, and harvest time taken from the emblem for the Holy Father's visit to Des Moines. The students bearing the standards are high school students representative of the Creston, Shenandoah and Harlan regions of the diocese. The bearers are Brian Hudson, Laurie Ludwig, and Scott Markham. The altar cloth, specially woven for this celebration by Connie Preneris of Des Moines, is carried in the procession and will be placed on the altar by students from the Atlantic, Guthrie Center, and Indianola regions of the diocese of Des Moines. Elizabeth Retz, Joe Downing, and Michelle McElroy are carrying the altar. 
gifts of the harvest are being carried to the altar by couples who have planted and harvested them. And they symbolize human labor and care for the earth and gratitude for the harvest. The containers with soil and hand tools are also a part of these gifts, which represent the land and those who work it. The gifts are being presented by Beverly and Tom Manning of Dallas Center. They are bringing peppers and zucchini. Others are bringing potatoes and apples, corn, grapes, wheat, soybeans and corn, carrots and pumpkins, heartland corn plant, a small hand tool, and a container of soil. All of these are part of the gifts that are being presented. are being carried forward in the procession by the Joseph Hayes family. Mr. Hayes is the man who wrote the original letter of invitation to Pope John Paul II. With him are his four children and his wife. The vessels, the flagon for the wine, the plate for the bread, and the chalice which is placed on the altar have all been especially crafted for the occasion by Mr. Jim Ross, who is a Des Moines potter. You will see those in a moment. In the past, the vessels for the use at the Mass had to be lined with precious metal. 
The present guidelines require that the materials be solid and considered worthy and valuable for their use at surface. It's interesting that the artist cast 53 cups for this mass and then picked yes. the one he thought the best. Yes, this is the one. The two married deacons are now preparing the book and the final clause for the table to celebrate the Eucharistic or Thanksgiving prayer in the form of this meal, reminiscent of the Passover meal, the Last Supper Jesus enjoyed with his disciples. Eucharistic prayer is really a prayer directed to God the Father. It begins with the dialogue between the celebrant and the people as they invite and encourage each other to praise to the Father. Rises to an acclamation in the holy, holy, holy. And then the bishop prays the prayer in the name of the community. During the prayer, the Eucharistic words of Jesus are always enshrined in this prayer. The living memory of the Lord is recalled, petitions for the church offered, and all ends in a burst of praise. All honor and glory to the Father. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of our creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with, uh, with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and country hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. Acolytes Robert Grant and Philip Cruzy are seminarians of the Diocese of Des Moines. Pray, brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. As we bring you our gifts, prepare us to celebrate the mystery of the cross to which St. Francis adhered with such burning love. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift, lift up your heart. We have not, Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We are to give thanks and praise. Father, all powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks. Through your beloved Son, who created our human family. Through him you restored us to your likeness. Therefore, it is your right to receive the obedience of all creation, the praise of the church on earth, the thanksgiving of your saints in heaven. 
we too rejoice with the angels as we proclaim your glory forever. gives you praise. All life, all holiness comes from you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, by the working of the Holy Spirit. From age to age, you gather a people to yourself so that from east to west, a perfect offering may be made to the glory of your name. And so, Father, we bring you these gifts. We ask you to make them holy by the, by the power of your Spirit, that they may become the body and blood of, of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate this Eucharist. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again he gave you thanks and praise, gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant it will be shed for you and for all men, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me.